Thanks everyone for coming to my talk. Um, as you can hear, I'm German, very hard accent. <laughs> so my name is Jamal, I'm from Cologne, and I want to speak about my experience with serverless. So I'm like one year in this um, kind of community. I did a lot of projects on, in production. And when my talk got accept, uh, accepted, I was thinking like, I want to do this different. I want to, because this is my first talk on a conference, I was thinking like, how can I do it better that people are going out of my talk and say, I learned something, I know something, and it was like, I was really trying to give you this experience. So, uh, so I was seeing a talk from Peter Bergen, he's an engineer at Fastly, and he did something very, uh, very great. Before he started with his talk, he set the context. So I want to do the same, so I take now two tweets I really like, that's fine. And um, you should always think about, about these two things, so setting the scene. Um, Jana Dogan is uh, an engineer at um, Google. She's working for Google Cloud Functions and she made the pro tip just don't blindly accept at uh, dogmatic advice. And if someone thinks serverless is a solution, sorry, you can leave, it's not silver bullet. But every time I say something, please, um, yeah, talk against my uh, opinion. I want to discuss this stuff. So, uh, no silver, silver bullet here. The next tweet is even better. So, he's, uh, Zach Holman said, was talking recently with a friend about how hard it is to write blog posts and give talks these days. The longer you are in the tech industry, the more opinions end up being, well, it depends. I'm not sure. These don't quite make for a good blog post. So, this is mostly my experience when I was like in a talk and I was like, yeah, you ask a question and the presenter was like, yeah, I don't know, it depends. And, I just want to set the scene that I have like a very strict opinion about what I'm saying here. So, my elixir of my talk is, it doesn't matter if you're on a startup or corporate, public cloud needs to be an op option for your company. So, every time we discuss serverless, people are saying like, but yeah, we have private data and we can't do public cloud and then I'm, yeah, you're always in this discussion. So, my context is, you can go on the pl public cloud with your system. Next one is, um, no real-time critical system. This is something I will talk about later. So it's not critical what we are doing here. Um, serving highly mutable business requirements. So this is also my context. And the last one is super important to me. Caring about fast business value delivery. So um, I think often in software engineering, we just want to try new stuff or do some complex things. I just want to deliver value to my customer. So that's my, uh, uh, my main main statement. But I want to give you a side quest. So because of the public cloud, there are some things which you can run on premise which are actually pretty nice. So side quest is open fast and the FN project which is even from Oracle. So you can just install it on your, on your system and you just can run functions. So um, coming back to the caring about fast business value uh, delivery, I really love Haskell and stuff like that. And I'm just looking forward for, do you, does, does someone know the uh, RFC for the 700 HTTP uh, status codes? There's a proposal and I, I'm looking forward when I can give back the 719 status code that this thing is implemented in Haskell, but yeah, but I want to deliver value. So it's in GitHub, you can just look it up, there's a guy, I really like, can't quit VH. <laughs> yeah, there's some funny stuff in it. but. Um, and I want you to shift your thinking from can I use this technology to shall I. So often when we discuss like can I use this database, can I do this, yeah you can use it often but what kind of um, constraints do you got and drawbacks. And this is like my opinion and just think about shall I do it. And this Now we can actually start, so my attempt for this talk, please get your notebooks out because I want you to um, busy writing down what did I wrong in my projects, which articles I think are great, which tools to try. There are a lot of tools right now emerging from this uh, community. Um, clips to watch and suggestions, how to start your journey in the serverless world, actually. So I just want to give you like the this, uh, this speed up start. My story starts with traveling. I love traveling. I think everyone loves traveling. And um, I was thinking about how do we get to our destinations? And it's often by plane, by train. My girlfriend is even in the background and we tried a night train. That was pretty 
a very event adventurous uh, experience for me. And when you are like in the country, there's something like bike sharing, right? You get around and you can see something of city or something. So, um, but nowadays, I really like to rent a car. I really love to have this Fiat, but never got it. But I like to be in a city and then decide, like, let's go out. So last time we were in Portugal, in Lisbon, and then we decided to go to Spain because we had a car. And I really loved it because we had so much time. We were like not um, strict to the um, transportation and everything. And I was like, I will do this more often, travel by car. And uh, some weeks later, some of my friends and me said, let's go on a, um, on a road trip um, to um, Antwerpen and then Paris. Antwerpen was really nice to travel, but um, who was ever in Paris and had a car actually? It was so. It was just crazy, crazy. So I said, like, I will not drive in this city. We just take an Uber or something, and that was exactly what we did. So we said, this city we have like only three days. We are like constrained on that, and let's take an Uber. And the first driver we got, he was just crazy. He was just running the crossroads. He was laughing and was saying like, um, je suis malade. Ich, I'm crazy, and was laughing. And we were like. I didn't know the handlebars and cars. I don't know if you recognize them, but I was using them. And this time, the first time in my life, I was like, okay, this, we will die. But we got to our destinations. And later, we took a, again a cab. And this driver was pretty great. He was like really uh, safely driving us through the city. And I was like, ah, there's a difference between drivers, actually. And one of my friends was always complaining about why we take Uber, I want to drive the car, I'm even better. He was like very frustrated that we use Uber. And then we're thinking like, hmm, this is actually the th same thing we do with um, computer science. So it's like giving away responsibility, use abstraction. And, um, yeah, and even this frustration I see in um, a lot of software teams. So I just want to start with giving away this res responsibility, like the cab driver. We just give him the res responsibility to get us to our destination. So, um, and actually, this is the history of computer science. If you never read this book, Kubernetes Up and Running, it's great. It's from um, Chelsea Hightower and Burns, and there's a sentence from the first programming languages to operate oriented programming to the development of virtualization and cloud infrastructure. The history of computer science is the history of development of abstraction that hide complexity and power you to build even more sophisticated applications. And I was reading this, I think it's the first chapter even, and I was like, yeah, this is, this is computer science. We always build more abstraction to it. And then I was discussing this with some people in my company. I was like, so I'm 31 years old, and I remember on-premise system. And do you remember when someone said, we need new hardware, but we need to wait like two weeks? Is there someone in the room still? Oh, yeah. This was great days. Like you said, like, yeah, two weeks. Then we get the new, uh, I don't know, HED drive and stuff. And I remember when finally VMware came around and someone said, like, in five minutes we have a new system. I was like, wow, this is the future. This, this is even more abstraction to it, right? Then infrastructure as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a service came around where you just described this kind of infrastructure I want to have. This was pretty great. And even more abstraction, platform as a service like Heroku, everyone knows it from us. And then it was just a matter of time. What is the next thing? Where's the next abstraction? And this is function as a service. This is the next step from going away from caring about the service, actually. So in a nutshell, function as a service, there's a trigger. Something is happening. It's nothing more. It's nothing magical. A function is running based on this event. It's, uh, it's this event source. It's doing something. And the function has like access to different resources, which is like can tell the result to and stuff. So it's nothing really more. Um, uh, most people uh, say ah, function as a service is platform as a service, but it is not. And for me, it's very important to you uh, to tell you that these are the difference. So, like if you have your Heroku system, the start startup time it's in minutes. Um, it's 24/7 running, and you need to also take care of some. Um, yeah, admin stuff on your um, on your platform, and the cost is in interval, and it's a monolith code of base. Function as a service runs in milliseconds. It's just a triggering, but um, when there's a, a request coming inside, and you pay for usage. This is the only bold thing I, on my slide here. You only pay for usage, with, which is very interesting for your customers actually. When you just discuss this stuff, 
Um, it's a single purpose function. Um, and what's also interesting is like this function are only um, spinning up if you call them. So there's something called the code start. This is very important. I will tell you later about it more. But um, when you call a function, when there's this event trigger, the function got, uh, will, will be created and then it will be, uh, it, it's running and you don't know when it's dying. So it's like a container spinning up and then you don't know if it's gone or not. So functions are always stateless. Serverless bingo. So every time when I say serverless, there's someone in the room and saying like, wait a second, there's a server somewhere. We know it. There's even a conference saying like, serverless is just a name. We could, we could have, have called it Jeff and they called them JeffCon, which was pretty nice because it's just a name. Everyone knows there's a server, but we don't need to have to deal with it. I remember when Meltdown and Spectre came around and everyone was freaking out. Everyone on the cloud was like, yeah, it's not our problem. It's like Google and AWS, they're dealing with it. So the definition of serverless, which I really like, is actually serverless solution is one that costs you nothing to run if nobody is using it. So really, if you have a system and no one is using it, you pay nothing and it's just running if, it, uh, if, fun, if someone needs it. That's pretty good. Um, a lot of people also think like um, serverless architecture are like just functions as a service, but it's not for me. It's like this three things. It's function as a service, just small uh, single purpose functions, specific patterns there and the community specific patterns coming around, also like old patterns like fan out, they're using everything. And what reminds me of the DDD approach is actually that the community is embracing to take third party services. Like half a year ago, I came into a project which uh, was making a complete diff a different app, but they were working on authentication. I was like, what are you doing? Authentication is not your core business. And the serverless community is saying, like, just deal with your business logic and buy everything from software as a service. And this is pretty deep into the roots of serverless architecture. I used to box when I was 20, and one of my trainers always said, like, speed is king, and this is also the most important thing when you choose serverless. It's super fast. Super. I remember I was in a project, and the customer said to us, like, you have six weeks to do this. We say, we do it serverless and I needed like two hours to have a mocked server with the APIs, and the client was just blown away by the speed of it, right? You just click something around and you have it. That's pretty good. So speed is king. If you care about speed and giving business value quick, then it's something to look, in, look into. So first learning. Ah, what I want to show about speed is king. First, my example. I want to compare right now Kubernetes against serverless. I really love Kubernetes. And I'm not a container guy and I'm not a serverless guy, but what I want to show you or, or make the point is like, how much knowledge do you need to spin up a Kubernetes cluster? And I do the same with serverless and what I need to know doing it serverless style, right? This is just some code flying around. Kubernetes, so what do I do? This is fine for everyone. It's just a small Node.js thing, yeah, I have like, I just have one endpoint and it's saying, hello, lovely Kandinsky people. Nothing more, it's not special, right? What do I need to do first when I do this uh, on Kubernetes? Docker file, so I need to know about Docker. Then I build the image, maybe I push it. Then I need to specify, uh, then I need to create on AWS, so I need to know about the AWS CLI again, how to create a bucket and everything. Then I need use COPS, COPS is the uh, Kubernetes operation CLI and need to like marry those two things together. So a lot of knowledge is already here. Then I define the ports, the strategy. Uh, this is like Kubernetes knowledge I need. It's not overweight. And now I do the service. And finally, I can use kube control, which is again a different CLI, to deploy it. And now profit. So it's just my point is to, not that it's complicated, but a lot of knowledge, what you need people to maintain it. So who wants to do it in serverless? Are you interested in it? Serverless, I will install the serverless framework, very creative from the people, but it's called like that, and a specific um, module um, for HTTP. This will be my um, application code. Not a lot more, just the last line where I have like this uh, explicit um, serverless HTTP call. And now I have this nice YAML where I say, I have this service called Kandinsky Demo, 
you run on, on this specific provider, AWS, I, na I named the runtime, I even can say stages, and which kind of functions are included in the service. I can even make the, like they combined, very nice. And I say deploy. Profit. So it's, I know it's not the same because I don't have control about, um, over it, right? But I'm pretty fast and it's working and the customer is already happy about it. So that's my point, like this thing. And junior devel developer thunderstorm is happening. So this is a nice uh, Twitter, a tweet from Alessandro Perelli. He said, imagine a new generation developer that starts her, his career learning and working on nothing but AWS Lambda. That experience will shape forever her, his worldview and expectation about how IT works. Everything we know and do today will be irrelevant. This is the issue. And this is really happening right now. There, we have a lot of people only doing stuff on AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. And they say, I don't want to deal with server di discovery. I don't want to deal with load balancing. They, it's just abstracted away. And if we not um, catch up with them, we also lose their, their fast developing style. And actually, I got a project where this happening. I had like a team of six, seven junior uh, developers, and they just were, they knew Python. They knew how to do stuff locally. And we say, okay, let's go serverless with them. This is the function. You just write Python code. You don't need to think about this whole, um, how the function are uh, combined, by together, uh, um, combined together, because the platform is dealing with it. And then I was running into the first problem, and this is my first learning from serverless, so please write it down. If you run fast, you can also run fast into the wrong direction. So seven people, you just explain them for like one hour how to do a function, and it's working. And people are like, yeah, I do the next function, the next function. And I was just like not in the project anymore and came back like some weeks later, and you can imagine like it was just exploding. So you need to have a concept from the beginning how to structure your stuff, and this is, this is right now coming. So, as you know, back in the days, everyone built a monolith. I think everyone is like, got the pleasure. Um, then the microservices got introduced. Um, so we got new problems like server discovery and functions are just, they're even smaller, but they have the same problems. So what we did, project structure. So my first point is like, have a project structure. So with the junior devs, we had like an incoming request. We had something like a gateway, which are taking the things and say, oh, here's a new event and they just created functions, 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 right? No one really knew the workflow anymore, no one, no one really knew how, like, how to refactor those stuff. So I was sitting down with a colleague and we were thinking like, how can we make this better? And we called an expert for a cloud platform. So we called really the provider of the cloud platform and asked like, how can we structure a serverless system? And his answer was like, I don't know. So the next learning was, no one really knows how to structure a serverless system. This is, uh, the, so this whole technology is so immature, you ask people and they just say, I do it this way, but maybe it's wrong, maybe it's right, so we are right now at this state where people are saying like, just do it, try it, and try to find a way. So this was not, we were not happy at this point, but then we were sitting down and, ah, yeah, um, I just want to pinpoint why this is happening. So um, Netflix, was the first company with the um, cloud native uh, virtualization VM architecture. Does someone know the white paper? It was pretty great. So Netflix was the first big platform giving away a white paper where they said like, this is how we build a VM native cloud system. After that, Airbnb came around and they have like this uh, paper about um, how they built a native container system. But for serverless, we don't have one. We don't have like a big system where the, you can look at and see, uh, not copy pasting, but you have like something to look at and see how they did it. So maybe it's you, maybe it's me who's building it, but right now there's no one. So one um, suggestion for you to read on SlideShare, Asha Sterking from Tel Aviv has a great um, slide about it where he's talking about it. So check it out. Um, Simon Wardley also talked about this new platform capabilities lead to new architectural style and new operational practices. This is very great. So we, we just have a new thing. Everyone knows it's good, but no one knows how to use it really. So we're just trying out. We're like in this experimental phase. Does someone know Blockbuster still? <laughs> yeah? Still yeah. So um, Blockbuster versus Netflix, right? Um, when you guess, 
who was the first having a website? Blockbuster or Netflix? Blockbuster. Who was playing with video, video streaming? Oh, and who went bankrupt first? <laughs> and this is the main problem because Blockbuster wasn't seeing this opportunity to use video streaming, right? And if you have time this year for just one um, talk, watch Simon Wardley's talk about why the fuss about serverless. If I can't convince you to try it, this is a talk who, which will um, convince you to try it. Because he's saying this is the next step for utilizing really computing power. Very good talk. So back to project structure. So we were sitting there in a room and discussing it and say, yeah, we can't change this incoming request and the gateway, but after that we can change the stuff, right? So we said, ah, we are like pretty um, into REST. So I said, let's try, uh, let's have like a resource handler. So the event is coming into the gateway, then you have a resource handler, which is taking care of this cloud-specific stuff like AWS or Azure, like abstracting it away and just take the stuff the application logic needs. And then it's like just routing it to the real functions. Only with this syncing, we already got like, um, um, we got the uh, opportunity or the benefit that we, can't, uh, we could test the functions on unit test level, right? We just have like application lo logic there. This was the first step from our, for us like putting structure on the system. But then I was like, yeah, but sometimes this function needs to call provider services, like specific provider services. And then in the next step, we like, everyone know dependency injection. So we say, okay, then we just say the resource handler can inject into the function provider services, and then the function just call those things, and we can just exchange them. Because one learning from this is also integration tests are very, uh, are very important in this year, because you, also deal, uh, you are often dealing with services and serverless architecture, right? You are just dealing with third-party stuff, and you need to somehow to test them so this was very good for integration testing and mocking. And this is the current state from us, right? Um, the learning was, when I was um, programming the provider services, there is a vendor login. It's for sure. You always have a vendor login. But I was thinking about, what do you want to have? Do you want to have a, a vendor login on a cloud platform? Or do you want to have like legacy hardware? Do you want to deal with technical debts? You have contracts where they data sent. So it's just, what what shall, shall you do? So what's the best um, option for you? But the vendor login, it's there. So the specific services um, on AWS, it's uh, different than on Azure. Careless. Uh, this is an, a shameless plug because based on our experience, we build this, um, a small script, which is just helping you give you the structure we now use. So one of my colleagues and me, Sascha Wolf and me just programmed this system. So it's on GitLab called Careless. It's just a script where you say, I want to have like on AWS a Python project. And it's just create you the pro uh, project structure like we do it right now. There's a Docker file for testing. It's only for Node.js and Python right now. But um, please try it. Please give feedback. So this is just like how we do it right now. And we know like with more communication, but with more people doing it, we just can improve it. This is the current state. And I would love like, people just trying it and complain about it, but yeah. Next thing I learned is, if not controlled, event-driven system will be dangerous. So we built this big system, and every, when you implement stuff, it's so you are totally into the system, and you know every corner. But if someone else is coming like, but how is the workflow, actually? I don't see it anymore. And uh, I remember the quote from uh, Martin Fowler. He said, the danger is that it's very easy to make nicely decoupled systems with event notifications without realizing that you're losing sight of larger scale flow and thus set yourself up for trouble in the future years. And then this, uh, the pattern is still very useful, but you have to be careful of the trap. And 100%, sure, this is true. So you, we built uh, two big systems and no one really knew how, like, how is this working. We, and you just can tame the beast. So my learning was just, you can tame the beast of this big event-driven systems with uh, frameworks. I know this is uh, very uh, not everyone is like on my page here, but I like frameworks for it, concepts on, and uh, observability. So I now I want to do, explain everything of that. If you're on AWS, have a look at step functions. So this is the very great uh, framework. So it's, it's, just, um, it's like a state machine where you have visual feedback. You can just say, 
when this function was like successful and this too run the next function, um, if you do event storming, we do a lot of event storming, and then we can just model our process modeling with this thing. So if you're on AWS, please try this also out. This is the tool you need to check out if you're on AWS. Um, there's a talk from Coca-Cola where they stay, say like they uh, shrink down a process from 18 hours to 10 seconds with step functions. Um, and if you want to know how they did it, there's a, how customers use AWS step functions on YouTube. So that's a pretty good talk where they just say, it's so easy what they did, and I was just mind blown. Like, yeah, you can use it like that. But so, as you know, my point is just to give you all things I know right now. So step functions is a very good tool. <laughs> as used in my um, code example, serverless framework, it's, it's a framework from a different company. They're cloud agnostic. But what, what is great about it, they already give you like definitions how to define services. You saw my YAML with the Kubernetes and serverless uh, comparison. That was serverless, um, was a serverless framework where they just say, you say which provider do you want to have, what kind of functions, how they should be triggered. And it even has a development workflow already built in. So you can deploy stuff, you can test locally, you can uh, lock stuff. It's all, everything is built in. So if you want to try out serverless or just want to play around, have a look at this framework because there's the, the community is so big and everyone is using it, you will get a lot of feedback back and it's pretty fast. SideQuest, there are also some other um, frameworks. Some, that's the one from AWS themselves and Apex. Maybe have a look, but if you ask me if you are a beginner, I would say take serverless first. It's a, in my opinion, it's a good start. Um, nowadays, observability is a big topic. Um, everyone aware of it? Yeah, some DevOps here. Yeah. Okay. Um, the funny thing is, I was talking to a guy in Cologne, and he was like, "Yeah, observability is pretty great to monitor your system and tracing and stuff, but it's pretty hard to implement." And I was like, "Wait a second, it's not hard." So I just want to show you an example in Go. I'm a Gopher, so I really like this here. So it's just here's no tracing inside. When I say, like, when you imagine how many lines do I need to put tracing on this, like observability, it's just five lines. So I need a library, Open Census. Google just um, opened up this Open Census uh, protocol, which is pretty great. If you never heard of it, it's pretty good. And I just put the function actually into a variable and just say, please handle this for me for tracing, nothing more. And I have observability and tracing. AWS has, has, have, uh, has even a service called X-Ray, where you just, you just build your functions on AWS and say, please activate X-Ray, and you have already tracing. It's already there. I remember Teams where we needed like two sprints to have uh, tracing. It's just there. Everything is uh, it's just out of the box. It's crazy. And this is also, yeah, every provider has different stuff. So, SideQuest, Epsagon, Databird, and Sensu. This is... Actually, I want to pinpoint Epsagon. I think this will be the this will be my bet. This will be a great tool. They know how to trace your system. It's a machine learning system. It even gives you like a visual feedback how your workflow is. They just recognize how your um, events are going around. So just write down Epsagon, Databird, Sensu. These are like tools, and you just see like every week new tools emerging in the community. They just say new tool, new tool. It's just very agile right now. Architecture documentation. I know. I don't know if you uh, like. How do you relate to uh, documentation? But in this project, the serverless projects, I saw like we need a documentation. At least the building blocks and the relations and the concepts. Like, how's our concept to write a function? How's our concept to structure our code? And this was just like four pages. And it was so good to have this because new people just saw like how we are working. And you should have a look at architecture um, frameworks. Does someone know Arc42? It's pretty great. Um, it's from Dr. Gernot Starke and CV from Simon Brown. So I used Arc42 for this. And it just gives you already like topics to write down. So this documentation just helped us a lot in our projects. The next learning was like there's a big gap between the cloud providers. So I'm actually on, right now, I'm on Google Cloud, I'm AWS, yeah, and Azure. I'm on all three big players right now, because sometimes you need something specific, and it's just on the one cloud provider. 
and you need to deal with it. That, uh, that AWS, I would say, is the most mature right now, but Google is catching up. Azure is also great in some parts, so you need to have a look. You need to, a lot of like investigations before choosing a cloud provider. The thing I was uh, I was uh, I was thinking about why why is it like that? So if you look at a phone, you know like um, how to use it because it's, it has a great communication. There's a good design already to it. Everyone knows how to use a phone. But serverless platforms, they are so new, we don't know how to use them. As I said, it's so immature. We need to discuss, we need to try out stuff. And that's why the serverless community, community needs actually people from different yeah, areas like domain-driven design to have a look into it and uh, give feedback. And there's a great talk, if someone knows Elm, it's the front-end language, and there's a talk from the creator of Elm, it's called What is Success? And he's just explaining that without communication, we can't have good design. He's just, it's a very good talk, and this is the same with the cloud providers right now. And now, uh, you remember, I said one of my friends was always complaining in the cab. He was just, I want to drive this car, I want to do this. And I just recognized in some teams, we had also this ignorance against serverless. Like something wasn't working, like sometimes the documentation are not up to date, right? And you just like, this is not working, uh, I don't like this cloud providers, let's do it um, on premise. And um, did someone hear about uh, socio-technical systems? It's, it's just the, finally people are recognizing that people and technology together in workplaces, they influence each other, like how we use Slack, how do we communicate? And we just introduced a new technology to a, pe uh, to a team and said like, you have six weeks to do this project. So there was a lot of constraints and people were just complaining about it. So my learning actually from this is like, if you want to try it, you, have, you, you, need, you need to have trust in your people. This is like the bottom down dysfunctional of teams and safe to fail environment. So we put in the first project, yeah, I'm honest, we put a lot of pressure on the people, like, this must be working. And they just, now they are, um, then they were like complaining about the serverless solution. But it were, yeah, just have it in mind, like, if you put people into a situation with a new technology, give them like space to try it out. And we did it wrong. Escape the web UI as SAP. This is actually pretty funny. Um, so there was a running kit. Um, every tutorial on the web is actually with a web UI, right? And you just start with a web UI and you're clicking around, put your services inside and everything is fine. And then we had our first product running and we said, oh, this is working great, but we need a staging environment. And then we said, okay, let's move everything from the, uh, an, an, a new testing environment. And then, I, then we wanted to move the stuff from staging to a new testing environment, but like in a book, the developer who did it was not there, he was on vacation. And no one really knew how he did it. So we needed to look in every resource, look at the uh, properties, and then, I don't say which cloud provider it was, but it was super slow on the web. So you can imagine you just create, you want to create a like, function and it takes like 30 seconds. And then you did something wrong and you're just waiting and waiting. So please start out with a web UI, but as soon as possible go to something like the framework, like the serverless framework, because it's like giving you more, yeah, more options. And it's even funny, on some web UIs you don't have all options, which is crazy. So just escape it. Just do the tutorials and then learn how to do it without the web UI. The next thing is actually going hand in hand. Um, it's embracing automation again. And so um, we just, uh, as I said, like we were clicking around and we didn't know how to do stuff. And I said, let's do it in the CLI. It's even better. We can do automation. We can build uh, even tools for ourselves to do it. And then I found um, Limoncelli and he has this automation mantra. So he's just saying like, if you do something, open a small wiki page, put inside, first First thing you do, put inside and document the steps you did, nothing more. You just write down like 10 minutes more work, you just write down, so I created this function, I uh, set this property and it's fine. If you're doing more and more the same step, you just look for automation. How can I automate this thing? He's like putting every time more automation on it and now our team is doing this. So they first write down a wiki, just say like in 10 seconds how to do it. And then in the end, we have self-service autonomous systems, actually. And this is a great article called Manual Work is a Bug, where he says this, so he explains it even better. So this is a suggestion for you to read Manual Work is a Bug from Thomas Lemoncelli. Very great thing. New platform, same rules. 
So sometimes uh, when you read about serverless, uh, they say, oh, I lost 40, um, like $4,000 because of serverless or AWS. And then you read the article and then you see, ah, oh, yeah, you pushed your credentials into GitHub. Who's doing this? So it's, it's the same roots. Um, watch your credentials. Don't push it into the repo. Um, it's the same. But we also have, it's a new platform and it has new rules. And um, there's a funny uh, blog article, so this is what I say, there's a trigger, there's a function, and a bucket. So bucket is just a storage, so on AWS it's called S3, S3. on Azure it's called uh, blob storage, just different names. So this guy, what he was doing, like, there was a trigger, and the trigger was when, some, uh, when a new file was inside, um, was created in the bucket, right? So let's say, go from the right, some new file is created in the bucket, that's a trigger, and then the function was running. The function was adding some metadata to this file. This is again a create event, because uh, the bucket thinks, oh, this is a new file, or, uh, and he was creating a new trigger. Then it was going back to the function, because it was running. And he just forgot a return statement. And this is called the $200 return statement uh, failure. So if you want to read it, lesson, uh, serverless lesson learned the hard way on Sourcebox. It's pretty funny, but every time AWS was giving back the money, so they, they know that people are playing around, it wasn't working, but you need to be careful of what you're doing there. And this comes to the next thing. Load and stress testing um, must be done, and uh, chaos engineering, is this already something you heard about? Yeah, Netflix is doing it and everyone. So we were building this AWS thing, or Azure, we were building the serverless system, and then we say, let's load test it, and all first like, no, but in the, they say it scales, right? They just give us the promise that it scales. And then we did uh, load testing against it, and we got timeouts. And I was like, what is happening? Actually, this was a benefit of serverless, right? It's, it's, a, it's a thing. And the problem is some services have properties set as default, which just like saying limited to 50 requests or something, or a timeout after 30 seconds, and we didn't know about that. So it's essential for you to even load test your serverless applications. And chaos engineering is great how we just, yeah, we're just playing around with it, like uh, just like um, delete a region or make it unavailable. What is happening? How do we react to it? This is, this is very great. And first I was like thinking, I don't need load tests, but you need them. And there's even um, an article why it's important to try and break your serverless applications on dev zone. So if you want to see it, this is, uh, he's saying the same that we encounter. So he was using a different service on AWS and it was just time outing. So don't expect that everything is scaling from the beginning. It's just, at this moment, I would say to you it's wrong. And this is super interesting. A new tribe is coming. So um, I built a serverless system for a client and he was testing it, user testing was great, and then more and more people were using it. And then the client was like approaching me and was saying, why is this function so expensive? And I was like, oh, yeah, because we're making a lot of calls to services. And he says, can we change that? And then I recognized, this is the first time I'm doing a refactoring based on money. So uh, there was a financial guy coming to me. It was not technical in the first place, right? After that, it was technical how I can do it. But uh, you can be sure that, the, that, the, that new people will come to you and you make refactoring and reasoning about, about costs. And it was actually a pretty good discussion. Um, yeah, refactoring based on cost. Um, there's a great article also um, about a guy who changed his system on Lambda um, using Go and he just saved a lot of money. But just have a look at this. It's pretty good. Next learning is have an exit strategy. So we built a great system, we were pretty fast, and then the customer said, it's great, a lot of people are using it, but now it gets too expensive. And we didn't thought about like, okay, when, when this business model is working, really working, how do we exit this? We were never thinking about the exit strategy. So if you, actually it was for me like, when you are a startup, do stuff serverless, and when it's working, you change it to on-premise or something, right? And we didn't, ha didn't have this exit strategy. So it's very important for you, if, I hope your systems are very successful, but have the strategy because it gets expensive. Next learning, respect the cold start. So as I said, when, a f um, event is, um, when there's an event trigger, the function is, um, it gets, um, gets created. And it's different from cloud provider to cloud provider how long this container is active, right? They just uh, kill it after some time. 
And the code start is the first time a container is created. It takes milliseconds more time than usual, but please be respected. Um, we had a lot of systems where we had like 100 milliseconds more or something. But you need to have this in mind. Um, real time critical systems never on serverless. So please uh, think about it. Um, and I think this is the last learning for me. Um, the pricing and SLAs are not very clear. So you think like, okay, I have this um, AWS Lambda function and um, I, the pricing is per request, but it's not by per request, it's by request and also by duration. And then you use different services like API Gateway, and API Gateway has also server, uh, costs, right? And you're always sticking together a lot of services and it's, you don't have any more a clue about what's happening. And also every service has different SLAs. So it's like very unsure how safe the system will be. It's, it's not what we develop, developers really like, but it's something we need to deal with. Um, if you're on AWS, there's a tool which is actually pretty great called Cloudcraft. And there you can just draw your system and it's calculating for you how expensive it will be. But it's only on AWS, Cloudcraft. And this is already my last slide. Um, yeah, we need to have like discussions about it. Um, yeah, conflicting talks. Um, I really love that the container guys are a little bit against it and we can just discuss the things, but we need inno innovation here. It's just so new, no one really knows how to do it. The slide with all the links, the important links, uh, I just, because I was always just firing up some links, so if you want to take a picture or just have a look, this, um, if you just want to ask me, one of the best books is from uh, Peter Sparsky, Serverless Architecture on AWS, very good explanation how he did it. And um, that other guy's um, a cloud guru. They have a website, it's pretty big, and it's completely serverless, so check it out. Yeah, and it's crying smiley because Cloudcraft is only on AWS. I don't know why they don't do it. End of fire, but we are good on time. How to decide to go serverless? This is just my first thinking, right? I say it like, um, Duration and memory is important. So if you have small functions with a, not a lot of memory and use, perfetto, you just do it. It's stateless, use it. And if the duration and memory goes up, yeah, maybe thinking about redesigns. But if you're up on the top right corner, you just have too much money. It gets just expensive. Ah, bonus round. I think we can do it. Um, or you don't see it. This is Cloudcraft. As I said, this is a tool on AWS. You can just draw this thing and Cloudcraft will just calculate how expensive it will be. This is pretty cool. So I just built like one week ago a system. So the left, so there's a user. You don't see that he's white, right? And uh, there's a, I want to add a text. That's the Lambda function the, in the middle part. Then we go to the left, the Lambda function is just um, saving the text in a DynamoDB. It's just a NoSQL DB in, on AWS. Then I'm putting a message on a queue saying, oh, there's a new text. Please um, um, transform this text to an audio file and then save it to a bucket. And then I have, again, another Lambda when I say, if someone is trying to get the text, please return all the text in the bucket. What I'm using here is a service from AWS called Poly which is like taking text and just generating a voice. And now you can see I didn't run this uh, service for like two days or something. And let's see if it's working. And then you can even see, um, I will just clear the text. Hello. I hope you had a lot of fun. Hans. Hans is a German. Um, that's even fun. And as you can see, I would just do Amy first. So as you can see, I got a uh, response, says processing, and I say, okay, that's fine. Let's see if this is done. And it's taking some time. You saw that, right? It's just, um, now it's ready. Let's hope that they translated it. Okay, yeah, and this is just, you saw it was pretty nice, and it's actually um, 
three functions, I think 80 lines of code, and I already could uh, make like a voice assistant of it, right? And I just use services, I just care about my business logic. And I think now, yeah, we are done. So I hope you wrote down some learnings from me. Um, you can reach out on Twitter to me. Yeah, and I hope you start your journey on serverless. Thank you. We are good on time. Any questions? Why did you choose serverless framework? Um, I tried out a lot of stuff. First, I was using Apex because I write my code in Go. But now AWS switched finally to go native, so you can just do it. And serverless, the community is just bigger and more people are using it. So I'm just, so I'm a solution architect and I'm looking like, is this ex, um, already in use by a lot of people? So that's why I just do a serverless framework. Ah, okay, yeah, 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 they're supported, that's also great, yeah. Yeah? So you mentioned about busting at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You tried to convert some of your functions to open busting. Not right now. But uh, it's, um, I think FN uh, project is even more promising to me, but I just wanted to give you also like this, there's also something you can run on premise. And I think FN project, the, you can even put every uh, programming language on it, right? The cloud providers are like restricted to specific programming languages, and FN project, I think they, they do it just in Docker containers, so you can just put everything up there, which is also pretty nice. Yeah, but I didn't try it so far. Okay, thank you. Yeah,